So, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. I mean, it's incredible to see this many people here to basically come and see what is essentially a science talk. Um, we're going to talk about something that is deeply familiar tonight, but at the same time, incredibly mysterious. Um, <coughs> this stuff is something that we do all day long. We're engaged in it all the time. And yet, I'm loath to think that any of you, or any of us even, understand where it comes from or what it is. And that thing is consciousness. Now, philosophers have been grappling with this question for centuries, rolling around all the time. But it's only in the last few decades, really, that scientists have started to have the confidence to really get into this subject. And why is that? It's because of new technologies of understanding the brain. The brain is the, the, the subject for the 21st century. New technologies allow us to look inside our skulls, see what's going on in real time, and without having to cut anything open, which is probably a bonus. <laughs> now, as neuroscientists gather information and catalogue what's going on in the head, and what does what, and how the brain does everything it needs to do, they're going to rub up against this question. You know, how does all that gooey stuff in there create consciousness, this experience of the world that we have? And what is consciousness anyway? How close are we to understanding it? And what do we do with this information when we get it? That's what we're going to try and discuss this evening. And to discuss it, I've got an amazingly erudite panel. Anil Seth is the co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Sussex. Next to him is Barry Smith, the director of the Institute of Philosophy at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. And finally, but not least, is Chris Frith. He's a professor emeritus at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging, and he's also at UCL. Now, before we go on, if any of you are tweeting, and please do, the hashtag is RIConscious. There was some worry that people wouldn't be able to spell it, but hopefully we've got an intelligent <laughs> audience. RIConscious, hashtag RIConscious. Um, and before we start, I want you all to look up at the screen. <coughs> Not yet. Well, yes, now. <laughs> look at what's up there. There's basically a circle of purple dots, and they flash on and off. Look around, look, see, make sure you see what's going on. And then, when the lights go down, just focus on the, on the square, the, the cross in the middle. Just focus on that, and keep focusing on it, and don't take your eyes off it. So I'm just going to leave that on the screen for a little bit now. So consciousness, I think, is about the most interesting thing that we can study in science these days. Um, but anybody who's interested in consciousness is faced with the immediate problem of how do we define consciousness. And there are some people who think that maybe we actually have to have a very precise definition of consciousness that everybody agrees on before we can make any progress. But I happen to disagree with that. I think that actually we can make progress without having a very precise definition to begin with, that definitions sometimes follow the fundamental insights in explaining something and don't have to precede them. But I've got to say something about what I think consciousness is, and hopefully it's something we can all agree on a little bit. Consciousness is any kind of subjective experience, the experience of eating a banana, the experience of reading a book, the experience of being a self, and the experience of hearing my voice. These are all instances of consciousness. Consciousness <laughs> is the appearance of a world for each of us Consciousness is what fades when you fall into a dreamless sleep at night, and it's what returns in the morning when you wake up. And for each of us, consciousness is literally all there is. Without consciousness, there is nothing at all, no world, no self. Consciousness is what makes life worth living, and maybe sometimes worth leaving. Um, this is why consciousness is really the most important and interesting problem we can study. Freud recognized this. Freud, in, in the early 20th century, noted that there were three what he called strikes against the centrality of humanity. And the first was Copernicus's work, which showed that, in fact, we weren't at the center of the universe. And then came Darwin, who showed that we weren't uh, apart from the other animals in the animal kingdom. We're all related. And for Freud, the third strike against humanity would have been an explanation of our conscious selves, that which makes us human. And as we progressively naturalize these things, we become more part of the world and less apart from the world. <coughs> 
So hopefully you've been experiencing something rather strange here. This is a visual illusion called the Lilac Chaser illusion, which was developed by a guy called Jeremy Hinton some years ago now. So all that is going on, as Alok said, is there are some, some magenta circles which occasionally disappear. And if you've been focusing on the green cross, sorry, the black cross in the middle, then maybe what you will have seen is, is that gradually the, uh, what, the magenta circles, they turn into a green circle that chases around and starts gobbling up all the magenta circles. Did people see that? Yeah? And if you stare at it long enough, then maybe all the magenta circles disappear and all you see is a single green circle uh, whizzing around. Did everybody see that? That's great. I mean, always a worry whether these things work in different kinds of halls, but it's a royal institution, so I'm sure it will. Uh, I wanted to show this because I think it's a very powerful example of a subjective conscious experience and how it's something that the brain is generating, constructing, that in this case is quite indirectly related to what's going on actually in the world. And this gives us a way in as scientists to try to understand what the, what the underlying neural mechanisms are. And really that's what I want to emphasise over the course of this debate. How far we've already come in understanding the biological basis of consciousness. Over the last few decades, thanks to advances in brain imaging technology and a revitalised attitude throughout psychology and neuroscience, I think real progress has been made in understanding what the brain mechanisms, and is the brain, I mean, at one point in time people were thinking consciousness might be more to do with the heart or other parts of the body, but what the relevant brain mechanisms are for consciousness. And I wrote about some of these in this article in The Guardian last week, but highlighting what I call eight key questions for consciousness science, and some of these are questions where progress has already been made. So, for example, we know quite a lot now about what some of the critical brain mechanisms are for consciousness. We know that the cerebellum, the big lump at the back, which actually contains more than half the neurons in the brain, is not so necessary for consciousness. You can get rid of that and your conscious experiences will be not so greatly affected. We know quite a bit about what happens when people undergo general anesthesia in the brain, why that leads to a total loss of consciousness. We can even begin to unravel some of the processes underlying what it feels like to have an experience of wanting to do something, a sort of experience of volition and will. And some of these Findings are having impacts now in the clinic and in hospitals as we begin to be able to do better diagnosis and treatments and prognosis for people having suffered severe brain injury. And as we'll hear probably from Chris, in psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia where he's done fundamental work. But as these scientific uh, findings accumulate, we confront the hard problem, which is the theme of, of this debate. And the hard problem uh, actually has, it's, it's coined by David Chalmers in the 90s, but of course has a much longer history going back to to Descartes and Plato, and it's really the idea that even if we understood all the physical workings of the brain, how behaviour is generated, everything that's going on to, so that the brain does what it does, there's still some fundamental mystery about why there should be anything like subjective experience attached to that. Tom Negel put it a different way, the explanatory gap. And so this is really why consciousness seems so resistant, seems so tricky to, to explanation. And there are a few responses, and what I want to, to just offer for, for discussion later on, is why should we be so worried about the hard problem? Often the hard problem is motivated by the idea that we, we kind of got an idea what it would be like to have a complete description of the brain at all levels of detail. But we don't. We don't really know. Despite the progress that we're making, we don't really know what it would be like to know how the brain does everything that it does. And that's why the science of it is so exciting, because we're beginning to develop new concepts to describe how the brain does what it does. So it may be that once we've got these new concepts, the hard problem doesn't seem quite so hard. Another reason for optimism is looking back at the history of science and something like vitalism. At one point in time, it seemed that the mystery of why animate things, or living things, uh, were distinct from non-living things may be resistant also to scientific <coughs> explanations. Some essence vitale, élan vital might be necessary. And we don't tend to think that way anymore with the development of new concepts. Light, connecting light to vibrations as well, kind of mysterious before we develop the right concepts. And of course, even if the hard problem remains a mystery, there's a pragmatic attitude, which is, well, what do you do? You know, let's say it's still mysterious why consciousness exists in the universe. We know it does, and we're beginning to realise that it depends on specific parts of the brain, so why don't we just go ahead and study those things. So I want to finish with a, just by raising a couple of issues that maybe we can discuss later. 
One is, why do people think consciousness is so hard to study? There always seems to be quite a furore about people claiming to have made progress in studying science, studying consciousness scientifically. The second challenge, and it's related, is what would count as a good explanation? So we talk about whether it's possible or not possible to scientifically explain consciousness, but I think it's very difficult to do that in the absence of having a good idea of what would be satisfactory to us. And the third uh, challenge, which is actually a lead-on to Professor Smith, who's going to follow me in a second, is the role of philosophy in, in this issue. So my colleague Christoph Koch from Caltech said very provocatively at one point, um, probably partly in jest, that philosophers have been wrong about every single issue under the sun over the last 2,000 years, and that um, while we should listen very carefully to the questions philosophers ask, we should never listen to their answers to these questions. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, let Barry take over. Thanks, Anil. It's a good challenge to pick up from there. So I, I think it's right that philosophy has made a lot of errors and a lot of mistakes, but we've been, we've been going a bit longer than you guys, so we've got a bigger history of mistakes. I mean, if you ask what is science good, good at, it's good at creating false theories. We wouldn't have got where we were today if we hadn't ruled out and eliminated a lot of scientific theories of the past. If you look at what was going on in the 19th century, an awful lot of it's now been discarded. So it's the job of progress to keep questioning, to keep revising, to keep the focus on what explanations are being offered. Now, philosophers are pretty bad at providing substantive explanations, but that's because we helped to create some of the subjects that are now giving explanations. Physics used to be called natural philosophy. Psychology was part of philosophy, and then it found it could work on its own two feet, and off it went. We let it go, we moved on to other things. But consciousness is the thing that still seems to remain within our purview, something that we're constantly focused on in philosophy of mind and worried about and trying to explain. And also, philosophers wonder what counts as a good explanation. Because even if we had a detailed understanding of what must be going on in particular regions of the brain, when we have the kind of conscious experience that you have now, of seeing the room from a particular point of view, of being aware of your neighbors beside you, of hearing my voice, even if we knew exactly what was going on in the brain. There seems to be an explanatory gap, as Anil said. There's a, there's a gap between knowing what's going on in the neural wetware and wondering why there should be this subjective feeling of experience, this way things are for you now, which seems so private and so personal to you. Now, I think that's what makes the whole topic difficult because why is it so puzzling given that it's so familiar? You're very aware of consciousness. Your waking life is spent within consciousness. It's, it's the background which is always there, modulated by the other things you're attending to and you're aware of. So the question is, why should that be so difficult to explain? And partly it's difficult because when we look at what science sets out to explain, it tries to give an objective conception of the world and of reality, as if giving a, a conception of that reality that doesn't depend on a particular person and their way of thinking or looking. It's supposed to be something that could be appreciated by anyone, and it's supposed to be describing the world as it is in itself. But the world as it is in itself is not complete until you include tastes, smells, feelings, moments of elation, perspectives on the world. And all of these things seem to be created by consciousness. And it's very difficult to know how to get at that elusive aspect of consciousness by just looking at something from an objective point of view. It's that subjectivity which is hard to locate in the world, somewhere in the world. Now, we know it resides largely or is dependent on largely the brain. Of course, we know that. But at the same time, we're wondering what the phenomena that we're talking about, what they really are. Because although we're all conscious now, you're conscious of my voice, maybe you're conscious of the smell of the room, the buzzing of the lights, but what are you actually, what are you actually able to do when you turn your attention on consciousness itself? When you try to not just look at people or 
smell things or, or feel the seat under your, your bottom, but try to just think of consciousness, it seems to sort of evaporate. It seems to disappear. It's hard to get at. It's hard to hold in view. And that, that's the problem, that consciousness is somehow transparent. When you try to think about it, you think about something you're conscious of, not about consciousness. Now, for that reason, William James, the great psychologist and something of a philosopher himself, he said, when we try to understand what consciousness is and we stop thinking about anything and just pay attention to our own experience, be very quiet, be very still, what is consciousness? He said, it's breathing. It's just breathing. That's a pretty false theory, I think, of consciousness. But you see why he said it. He said it because you can't seem to get anything else when you do a meditative uh, exclusion of all else in the mind. That's what you're having. Breathing is going on. But of course, he was talking about being aware of breathing. So their consciousness was still there. It was the awareness of breathing that he was getting hold of, not just the breathing. So consciousness is hard to get hold of. And I want to sort of make common cause, I think, with Anil by saying there isn't just one hard problem of consciousness. There are many hard problems of consciousness. I think philosophers, perhaps because of David Chalmers focusing on the, the question in the singular, have, have done the disservice to the many things we're puzzled about. What philosophy should do is should keep the neuroscientists honest. We should keep our focus on the phenomenon of consciousness and say, look, this is what we're interested in, this subjective feeling of experience and some of the many ways that we experience consciousness in our, in our ordinary lives. Let's focus on those things and not something that you would rather talk about which is easier to explain. Let's make sure we've got consciousness in view. Now, when we, when we do that, we come across one of the first hard problems. That is, when you're attending to consciousness, you might change it. Consciousness isn't a single thing, and in fact, we know it seems to exist at many levels. So you have levels of consciousness in that sometimes if I'm sitting by the shore and I've got my feet in the water, I might be having a conscious experience of the cool water around my feet. Then I might be having a conscious experience of how lovely this moment is and be somehow caught with the, the beauty of that experience. But when I then think about my enjoying the beauty, I become self-conscious. And I sort of destroy, I get in the way of my own pleasure, and I ruin it. So there are these levels of consciousness which, when you're having attention to them, can maybe change them. And it's a good question for philosophy and for neuroscience whether when you're conscious of being conscious, you're really just bringing to light something that was already there, or whether you're actually altering or even creating what comes about. Many of us know what it's like to say, I've had a toothache all day. And yet there were certain blissful moments in that day when you seemed to forget about the toothache and talked about other things. Question, was the conscious experience of pain going on you just didn't notice? Or was there no conscious experience of pain when you didn't notice? Is it the attending to something that makes it conscious or is it there to be conscious of? Those are difficult questions and I think philosophers and neuroscientists should work together to try to clarify them. I'll just end with two more puzzling thoughts. We sometimes say consciousness is being awake and aware, but when we're asleep and we're dreaming, that seems like a conscious experience. We're aware of the world that we're inhabiting, strange world, although its strangeness doesn't appear until the morning. We're in that world, things are going on. That's a state which we sometimes describe as someone being unconscious because they're asleep. So think how difficult it is to get consciousness in view. And a final thing that's difficult is where is consciousness? We tend to always want to talk about consciousness as the inner life, and then we ask, where's the inner life? And we think it might be located sort of behind the eyes. But it doesn't always feel as though it's behind the eyes. If you have a pain in the ankle, the feeling of pain seems to be in the ankle. And yet feelings are conscious experiences. So is consciousness in the ankle? It's a little funny if it starts wandering around. But that should get you worried about just whether consciousness is identified with something inner and especially in the skull, because it doesn't feel like that. I think you're aware of me talking to you. I think you're aware of your surroundings and your, your near neighbors. So consciousness seems to be taking in a lot of the world. It's, it's as if it's an inner view of an outer world.
So it's difficult to locate, but it's definitely something that has to be experienced if there is consciousness. So the dilemma for science might be put something like this. If consciousness is the sort of thing, a conscious state is the sort of thing that you have to experience, and you can only experience it if you are the person who is conscious. So if, if, there's, if there's consciousness going on in someone, it's that person that must experience it, and it's accessible only to them, only to them. But if it's only accessible to them, how could science study it? That's one of the horns of the dilemma. The other horn of the dilemma is if science can study consciousness, won't it always leave out something that seems to be part of fully understanding it, namely what it's like to experience it, what it's like to be in that state? If you describe everything about it and you give a good explanation of that conscious state, but you leave out what it is to experience it, something that seems only the subject can have, haven't we left something out of the story? So either we stick to the experience and we don't seem to have the tools to describe it in science, or we describe it in science and we seem to leave the experience of it out. That's the dilemma. I don't think it's irresolvable, but I think we have to somehow find a way to drive between those two horns. I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm just referring to what Barry just said about how you can change people's consciousness so easily. Apparently one of the best, people, best ways of, if you want to be nasty to someone, is ask them, how happy are you feeling? Because it will definitely make them feel less happy. <laughs> so I don't think we have any idea how activity in the brain enables us to have subjective experiences. And the troubling thing is that we don't even have any idea of what the, a satisfactory answer to this question would look like. On the other hand, I do believe that by studying the brain and by studying behaviour, we have learned a great deal about the nature of consciousness in the last 50, 100 years or so. And this follows on from what Anil was saying, that first of all, we discovered that the Earth was not the centre of the universe, and then we discovered that man was not the unique feature of the animal world. And I think finally we're discovering that consciousness is actually a rather small part of the mental activity that allows us to behave and to be human. And most of the work the brain does is not actually associated with consciousness. And I guess my hero in this respect is not Freud, but Helmholtz, who actually gave several lectures in this very room about 150 years ago. And he invented the concept of unconscious inferences to explain perception. And he did this, he'd had two reasons for deciding that there must be unconscious inferences. One was that he looked closely at the eye, which of course is part of the brain, and discovered how, what a very inefficient organ it was and how very degraded the information you get from it is so things are out of focus and not coloured and so on. And he also discovered nerve conduction. He was the first person to measure the speed of nerve conduction and also reaction times and he discovered that our perception of the world is extraordinarily slow. And he put these two points together and said that's because our brain has mechanisms which enable us to construct what's out there in the world on the basis of these very poor signals that we're getting from our senses. So you have poor signals, lots of work has to be done before we get this vivid impression of the world out there. And the, this kind of work we're entirely unaware of and we think we have a direct relationship to the world. But it gets more interesting than that because, for example, particularly the study of people with brain damage, you can find many situations where they are apparently responding making actions, rational actions, to things which they claim to be completely unaware of. A famous example is patient DF, who has damage to the inferior temporal lobe, which has caused her to be unable to recognise objects because she cannot see what shape they are. To the extent that if you ask, if you give her a slit and say, can you line up this rod with that slit, she's at chance. She has no idea what the orientation of the slit is. But if you ask her to put her hand through the slit 
She does it with complete accuracy and lo rotates her hand before it goes into the slit into the right angle. So this is an example where there is information about something about the world that can be used to guide her actions, but apparently does not emerge into consciousness. And there are many examples like that. And of course, you can find that exactly the same thing is true of people with perfectly normal brains, but of course, you have to use much more subtle experiments. The, in the case of the brain damage, things are revealed in their, all their starkness. And because Tony Marcel is sitting up there, I have to mention that one of the key experiments along this was in 1983, when he demonstrated that people behaviour is affected by words which they have not been aware of seeing because they are presented so briefly. And there are other features of that, the apparent lack of use, need for consciousness. There's a famous Libet experiment suggesting that, showing that we, the brain, to put it in quotes, is actually deciding to lift the finger before we're aware of making the decision. More recently that's been done with where you choose to go left or right, and again brain imaging can predict something like six seconds before which direction you're going to go long before you claim to have decided which one to choose. There's some slightly controversial experiments showing that if you ask people to make complicated decisions like buying an expensive car and being given 12 different attributes that you have to take into account, people can actually make better decisions in the sense of buying the better car if they're not allowed to think about it beforehand. <laughs> so... So what's the point of all this consciousness? We can do so much without it. And one of the other things that David Chalmers talks about, I don't know whether he actually invented it, is the idea of the philosophical zombie, which is not like the zombies that we know and love in the cinema, but is someone who is exactly like us and behaves exactly like us, but actually has no conscious experience. And the, the idea is that because you can think, this is supposed to demonstrate that you could have something an agent with no conscious experience which would nevertheless behave exactly like us. So the question is, does that, is consciousness just an epiphenomena? Is it irrelevant? Are we actually all just like zombies? And that's where I think, there's a sort of second point I want to make, is surely this must not be true. It's <laughs> 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 a good philosophical statement. Um, there must be some advantage for having consciousness. It seems to use a great deal of brain activity. So from an evolutionary point of view, it must have given us some advantage over the zombies that we have replaced, apparently. Um, and I want to suggest that, first of all, it's a sort of illusion to think that consciousness is a private world of our own and we can never access other people's because what we're conscious of is the one thing that we can actually share with other people in the sense that we can tell people what it's like. We can tell people what you're supposed to see in that illusion and then you all see it. So what I'm suggesting is that one of the perhaps easier problems for scientists to look at consciousness is to ask questions like, what's it good for? What does it help us to do? And why, what are the special things that we need consciousness for? And as I just said, there's some nice work showing that, the, on the one hand, our experience of our action seems to be too late. We make up a story about why we did something after we did it. But on the other hand, it's precisely because we can make up stories to each other and justify why we do things that we can actually agree about what is the right way to act. This is a way of generating cultural norms and so on and so on. And there are even experiments showing, for example, if you tell people, famous scientists say there's no such thing as free will, then subsequently they're more likely to cheat in an exam, presumably because they now believe that they cannot resist their <laughs> low base impulses. So that would be one example. The other example which I'm particularly interested in is the idea of we can actually, by talking to each other about our sensory experiences, we can actually improve our... we can gain a more accurate picture of the world and we've been doing experiments like this where we have two people doing a typical psychologist difficult signal detection task and we can show if they're allowed to discuss with each other when they disagree about the answer, they can actually come up with a better answer than even the best one working on their own. And this seems critically to depend on the ability to think about your sensations, to think about how vivid and confident you are in them and to talk to other people about it. And I think this is where 
perhaps the value of consciousness is emerging, it's particularly valuable in these social situations. And if we want to understand it, these are the kinds of situations we should explore consciousness in.